My name is Lucy Letterhandler. I'm the curator here at the Art Gallery of Southwestern Manitoba in the city of Brandon, which is located on Treaty 2 territory, the traditional shared lands of the Dene, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Anishinaabe peoples, and the homeland of the Metis Nation. Anyone who is joining us from other indigenous lands, I invite you to take a moment to honor those cultures by speaking their names as well. The AGSM is hosting the 17th annual member show and sale through December 18th. Today, we are joined by two or three of our artist members who, who will be sharing their work and thoughts with you. Uh, just a note that TJ Southam could not be with us today, but to anyone who tuned in, especially for them, you're certainly in for a treat with other artists, Kurt Knoll, Rochelle Trelor, and hopefully Jan Brankovic will be joining us as well. These artist members will be speaking about their work individually, and then we'll meet for a conversation afterwards. You are welcome and invited to join in with us. And the way that we do that is through the comment section on Facebook or YouTube, where you can type a comment and we'll be able to respond to it here. So for our first artist, I would like to invite Kurt Knoll to join me on screen. Kurt Knoll is a human. He was an art director, designer, copywriter and illustrator for a mid-sized advertising agency during the 1980s. Then he went to graduate school, earned a PhD in the study of ancient dead people, and eventually arrived at Brandon University. The AGSM figure drawing group inspired him to begin again as a painter, and so here he is. Kurt, welcome. Hi. Hi. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Um, we're going to uh, try this uh, share screen thing here. Great. And uh, I hope it works.
How are we doing? Almost there. So you can see the fir first slide? Okay. Okay, good. Um, I have um, submitted three paintings to this year's member show. You can see two of them here. Um, two different visual languages. Uh, one is a naturalistic painting, the one on the left. The other two are uh, abstract paintings um, in, uh, I guess you'd call it the dialect of cubism. Um, so this is the first of the three. Um, this this kind of, I, I've done a number of these kinds of paintings and um, it's, it's kind of a nice respite from uh, the more complex paintings that I do. I, I, many of my paintings require a great deal of uh, preliminary, re, you know, preliminary sketches and um, design problems that need to be worked out. Uh, not so with this kind of painting. This kind of painting, I just go around the house and pick up some objects and arrange them on a table, and uh, there you go. Uh, this particular example, all the objects came from the kitchen, but that's not always the case. Uh, some of these paintings, I pick up objects from around the house. Um, Tina and I have uh, a number of old objects, some antiques and some old toys and toys that I played with when I was a kid, some toys that my parents played with when they were kids. Uh, and those toys sometimes show up in the paintings as well. But um, I guess the, the key to this kind of painting is um, the preliminary sketch, uh, the preliminary drawing. Uh, the drawing has to be just about perfect before I pick up a paintbrush. Otherwise, um, the, pain, the painting will be a train wreck. Uh, so um, I make sure the drawing is right. And then, and then, of course, it's not just a matter of um, coloring it in like a coloring book, but um, you know, paying attention to the way the light hits surfaces and reflected light and uh, colors in the shadows and things like that. But uh, patience and diligence um, produces a painting like this. It's it's, it's a pretty straightforward kind of painting to do. Um, the second painting in the show this year is um, produced in uh, in a way that's very similar to this one. Uh, I just walked around the house and picked up some objects and created a composition from it. But of course, here I'm working in the uh, in the language of cubism. Um, but it's not, I'm not a purist. <laughs> With I guess nobody is really. Um, cubism itself has never been kind of a pure abstraction. So, um, so I, I tend to throw in little bits of uh, naturalistic illusion here and there. In this canvas, you can see it um, on the right-hand side with the brook, and also on the left, lower left side with the um, with the bishop. Um, but it is painted in the mode of a kind of synthetic uh, cubist construction on a canvas that um, has sand on it, uh, which is something I learned from Brock. Um, I, I think it creates a uh, really interesting um, structure to the canvas, uh, an interesting kind of effect. So uh, I often try to uh, branch out and do things like that. Um, so that's the second of the three canvases. The third painting in, in the show this year is, is uh, more complex. Uh, it took much longer to prepare and uh, design this uh, painting. I, I spent a great deal of time doing um, preliminary sketches on scrap paper. Um, the seed of the idea had to do with the, uh, well, obviously it's a chess player. I wanted to uh, paint a chess player. Uh, I've done card players and things like that in the past. Um, but the seed of the idea was the face. I wanted to um, um, present the face twice, but overlapping each other, uh, two perspectives in the same space, in the same portion of the canvas. Uh, so that was the um, initial challenge that uh, um, brought me into, into this particular construction. Um, but I also wanted to um, throw in a, a few um, allusions to uh, the tradition. Um, some of you, probably most of you are familiar with uh, with the history of uh, cubism as it's shifted from what the historians like to call analytic 
to a later phase that historians like to call synthetic. Uh, there was a famous painting that uh, Picasso produced. It's actually not one of his better paintings, but it's always in the history books, um, in which he took some um, uh, 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 printed copy of a um, cane bottom chair and cut out the cane portion of the of the print and pasted it onto his canvas and then painted on top of that. Um, so I decided I'd include cane bottom chair in my painting. Um, I didn't use a print, I just painted it on, but uh, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have a couple of cane bottom chairs here in the house, antique chairs, and I, I used that as my model and put some caning into the painting. I also uh, played around with the, the way the uh, chess board itself should appear, and you'll see it in the sketches here in a minute what I mean by that. I also decided to use um, a glass of wine as kind of a, a glue, a kind of linchpin to hold the structure of the canvas together. Uh, and I painted the, um, the wine glass in a naturalistic way, uh, the illusion of three dimensions, um, which gives the viewer um, a task to perform to sort of step back and uh, make sense of the, uh, the composition. Um, but I want to uh, focus, uh, there's there's the wine glass, there's the wine glass, and also the little ivory um, knight uh, I decided to paint uh, in three dimensions, whereas most of the other pieces are quite um, two-dimensional. But I, I want to focus on the um, the face. Like I say, I, I, my goal here was to show the face twice in the same space. Um, one of the two faces is obviously a little bit more naturalistic than the other. The profile is uh, a bit more naturalistic, fairly easy to spot quickly. Uh, I suspect the viewer doesn't notice the full figure face right away because it's been reduced to uh, geometric shapes. But you can see the nose and the, the uh, very geometric mustache and goatee in the center of the face. What I want to, want to do here is show you the, um, the sketches uh, for this face. I painted this during the COVID pandemic, so the model was me. <laughs> I had Tina, my wife, uh, snap a couple shots of me, and I used those for the, uh, for the, for the painting. So here's the first sketch, the, um, the profile. You can see, obviously, the, the forehead, the nose, the mouth, the chin. Um, take a look at where the eye is located in the sketch. I had to move the eye in the painting. You can see I moved the eye back and up just a little bit. And uh, the reason for that will become quite obvious in just a moment. But also uh, take a look at where the, uh, the ear is located and how that shows up in the final painting and the, uh, the color of the coat so forth, back of the head. So that was the profile that I used for the, the painting. And then um, for the, um, the full frontal view of the face, I used this sketch. And uh, now you can see why I moved the eye in the profile because the eye in this sketch does double duty with the eye from the profile. And then, of course, you can see the nose and the, uh, there we are. Um, you see the nose and the mouth. So forth. Uh, the other eye, the, uh, the man's right eye, the eye on our left, is um, embedded in the ear of the profile. And what had been a, a little leafy garland behind the man's ear becomes the man's eyebrow. So that, uh, that was the, uh, the goal, to try to create that kind of structure to the face and then produce a, uh, a synthetic cubist composition that would complement that structure. And um, as you can see, I, uh, in good old synthetic cubist tradition, I've thrown in everything but the kitchen sink. I have a little bit of uh, fake wallpaper and... Um, uh, some peeling paint on a wall and uh, things like that.
here are um, some of the preliminary sketches. Uh, these are two of the earliest preliminary sketches. You can see that I was toying very early on. I was playing around with the idea of um, creating a, a naturalistic linear perspective in the lower half of the canvas and then have a transition into a, an abstract cubist painting in the upper half of the canvas. I toyed around with that through a number of sketches, but um, just was never quite satisfied with the way it was looking or the way it appeared in my mind's eye. So eventually I gave up on that idea. Um, I don't know, it seemed a little too trite, maybe a little too pretentious. But you can also see in these sketches how I'm, uh, this is the early stages or first stages where I'm um, trying to figure out how the two faces are going to overlap each other uh, and haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, some of the later sketches, uh, I've done away with the linear perspective in the lower half of the uh, canvas and I'm um, moving toward this composition that's going to look a lot more like the finished product. Uh, but uh, again, quite haven't quite figured out how things should be arranged, which aspects of the different angles of the human figure should be shown, which as aspects should be um, should disappear, uh, and uh, also which aspects of uh, background material should uh, should uh, play a role and where they play a role. I had to pull, uh, figure all that out gradually with a bunch of different sketches. Um, and again, if you look at the face, um, I still haven't quite figured out where, wh how the two faces are going to overlap. The, the, the left-hand sketch especially, uh, I, at that stage, I think I'm still toying with the idea of maybe doing part of the front, full frontal figure of the face in naturalistic style. Um, some of the forehead and nose maybe would have been more naturalistic in, in that version, but I wasn't too satisfied with that, so I quit that idea. Um, after uh, th these sketches are kind of typical of, of the process I go through for for designing one of these pictures, um, and after I finally set settle on a line drawing uh, of what the composition should be, uh, then uh, I arrive at a stage where I can. I uh, use that line drawing and colored pencils, again, on scrap paper to try to figure out a color scheme for the painting. Uh, I knew I wanted the color scheme to be some combination of golds and earth tones and so forth with some kind of blue or blue-greenish kind of color scheme. Uh, that was sort of the um, range of color that I was looking for the mood I wanted to create with this canvas. But I wasn't exactly sure uh, what the color scheme should look like. So I went through a couple of these types of sketches till, till I worked it out. Um, the, the color on the right-hand sketch there is a little closer to what I eventually painted, but um, still not quite there. Um, nevertheless, uh, this, this... Oh, and um, you can also say I'm, uh, I haven't quite figured out some of the drawing yet either. Um, the the uh, this is the canvas uh the left hand uh photograph here is is the actual canvas with the line drawing on it and if you look at the chess board uh you can see i was still playing with the idea of having several of the chess pieces uh in linear perspective um the the rook and several of the pawns as well as the knight um ultimately decided that was a bad idea and painted those out uh, before I started uh, started the final form of the painting, so you can see you can sort of compare the line drawing on the left, which is the raw canvas, with the uh, the same canvas uh, in its final form there on the right. So um, those are the three paintings that I uh, submitted: one naturalistic, two cubist paintings. Um, I don't know if they are representative of everything I do, but I am quite proud of each of the three of them. This morning I was on a, a Zoom meeting with Kurt Schultz and several other people, and uh, Kurt Schultz put in a plug for uh, for the 
uh, member show and, and told everybody. And uh, Kurt Knoll has has two really good paintings in the show. And uh, I said, thank you, Kurt. Does that mean the third one is a bad painting? <laughs> he said, oh, I missed the third one. I didn't realize it was there. Um, but anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's what I've got. And um, I'm going to see if I can stop sharing the screen now. Yep. We, we took it down. Uh, I just want to, okay. I'm just going to pop this one up real fast. So this is the installation. Um, that's, yeah. why the, <laughs> that's why the pair. That's why Kurt missed, yeah. that's why Kurt missed the third one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It has nothing to do with the painting. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Kurt. We're going to have sure you thing. back in, uh, in 15 minutes. But first, I would like to invite up on the screen, Rochelle Traylor who is a neurodiverse artist with a rare wrist disease that has made her adapt her approach to painting, switching between her left and right hands and therefore the left and right sides of her brain. The result is a work that plays between opposite genres and palettes. Bold abstraction and neutral realism combine in her work, giving it the power of innovative storytelling. So please come up here, Rochelle, and we will show them what you submitted to the show. Sorry, you're muted. I just want to say I'm a little bit intimidated after Kurt's explanation that's so technical and I was so interested in it. Um, I think I feel like we're kind of swinging both ways. He's coming from a really technical, really interesting perspective and I'm coming from, from a pretty emotional <laughs> perspective. So. <laughs> I guess that's the beauty of artists is we're kind of different, hey? Absolutely. Um, my first painting, I guess we're going to start with, that that's Scarlet. Um, where do I start? Uh, I feel like I'm with you with this too, Kurt. With the whole COVID thing, I was having trouble finding subjects. <laughs> so I found a picture of myself from about 15 years ago. I would have been about 21 ish um <clears throat> excuse me and i kind of went to town with that but the whole idea of scarlet is letting go of perfectionism i have been a huge lover of abstract art for many many years because of my degenerative de wrist disorder i um, am really limited on fine detail work so i was doing very huge pieces of art um five by six canvases because I was able to use really large brush strokes and during COVID I kind of decided that this was my one and only opportunity to learn how to do small detail still life things so I knew that using my right hand was going to be a problem so I sat down one day with my left hand my non-dominant hand and went to work and um, I found out that I'm capable but it does take a lot extra time, a lot of extra effort. I have to go very, very slow to get a good precise line. So that was kind of interesting. It, it made, it forced me to kind of slow down. Um, it, it forced me to have some time to myself. I'm a stay at home mom with two rowdy boys. And this was kind of my time to um, find quiet, find solace and concentrate on something almost meditative. Um, so there's Scarlett, she's me as a 21 year old girl, um, just fighting for perfectionism, um, seeking approval from others. And I just needed something more carefree. And yeah, so in this picture, you can kind of see the details of drip work, which I would have done with my right hand, the abstract, bold, colors and lines are all my right hand and the more muted um, realism is my left. Um, I find that I fight, a, we all know about, most of us know about perspective of having cool tones in the back, warm tones in the front to have some sort of perspective going on, some depth to your work. And I fight that a lot. I love to mix and match colors but I feel like I successfully 
have some depth in this painting. I love the warmth up front and the, I don't know what you would call that. I kind of see it as a bit of a cityscape or something going on in the background with the dripping navy blue paint. Um, yeah, I just, she was my first larger canvas. I had done a lot of work in notebooks and smaller paper, but she was my first um, left-handed realism painting on a canvas. So I'm pretty impressed with her. And then this is um, Violet. Her whole idea behind it was just to play um, acknowledge your inner child, let go of um, the expectations and have fun. So I don't know, I've always wanted, I don't know what style you would call this, but I've always really, I, it's not, um, just the paintings with a bunch of circles in them. I don't have the technical term for it, but I wanted to go in a like really grand scale, not points, but circles. Um, I don't know if you'd, I don't know, my husband thinks they're kind of like her bouncing around in a ball pit. That is not what I was going for. <laughs> but she's definitely having fun. I find, kind of see her as sort of a fashion icon, plus size model, just not giving a crap about what other people think of her. Um, yeah, so this was my second on canvas painting, left-handed realism um the circles were all done right-handed she's got freckles because I feel like freckles are grossly misunder um underrepresented in paintings in art so I gave her freckles um yeah I just she's just fun I enjoyed doing that one a lot we can move on to Viridian, yeah. She is based off of a girlfriend of mine who um, has worked really hard to get where she's at in her career. It's a male-dominated field. She's well-educated, and she still has to fight to get the respect she very much deserves. And I wanted to, to paint this for her and kind of in honor of all she's worked for. She's got that big heart, that sort of abstract heart at the front. That's because she has a giant heart. I um, love her for that. And then sort of the target in the back is very much, she's a woman in a male dominated field. And she very much has a target on her all the time of good or bad. They're both, you know, I didn't want to, that's why I did it in black is I didn't want to make it, um, a negative thing or a positive thing because it is a negative and a positive thing to be a woman in a male dominated field. And then there I go trying to throw a little bit of cool tones in the back. I don't know if I successfully did that, but it's there. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, she was my third canvas painting left and right handed. Um, I started doing this left hand and right hand thing in um, July. So it's all very new. And I finally gave myself permission to put it on a canvas. And yeah, there's just some really unique details. And I let myself kind of be imperfect. I don't know. I, there's some quirkiness about it, but I think it's pretty neat. And there's all three of them together. I When I was packaging them up to the show, I was a little bit sad to see them go. I kind of feel like they're a big part of my story as an artist of sort of moving from sort of a stuck position of I can't, I can't do what I want to do to a position of um, success, like kind of climbing that mountain and getting up to where... I wanted to be. I've been painting since I was 16, like as a hobby, and I'm 36 now. So, you know, it's been 20 years of getting there. And finally, this summer, I decided I was going to take it very seriously and try my best. And here I am. We're, we're working on, yeah, 
just this left-handed, right-handed thing has been more successful than I thought it would be. I was very hesitant to try, but with a lot of push from a lot of friends, I decided I would wing it and I'm happy I did. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Okay, um, so let's uh, let's bring Kurt back up and we can have um, we can have a chat, the the three of us. So I think uh, um, I'll remind everybody that you can you can engage with us through the comments wherever you're you're joining us online. Um, but let's start out by talking about this pendulum swing, this um, uh, this technique first versus um, emotion first approach to painting. Um, so uh, let's start with Kurt. The, there's um, the, the, the title of, of the, the piece that you focused on, Nightfall, um, has this, this huge narrative element, this kind of uh, um, you know, tragic Arthurian thing happening <laughs> that you didn't, you didn't even mention. Um, it just it seems like you you it popped into your head and then you fixated on composition as opposed to Rochelle who says let's start with this friend with a big heart and let's build up this work until it's it's told the story that I want to tell it. So why don't you talk, why don't you start by telling us where the concept came from, what the symbolism is. Okay. Um, first I'd just like to say I, I resonated with Rochelle's talk because uh, I'm having a similar but different kind of struggle. I've lost most of the sight in my left eye. And uh, my right eye is not great either because I have glaucoma. So I've uh, been struggling a bit with, with those kinds of things as well. And so uh, Rochelle's speech really resonated with me uh, on that level. I feel for you and I understand the uh, challenge and I, I kind of feel your your pride in your success as well. That's a great story. Thank you. Um, titles. Uh, my paintings generally have one of two type of titles. Either it's a boring title that simply describes the visual image, like uh, composition in red and yellow, or um, it's some kind of clever pun or something like that. And if the painting has a clever pun, it's because my wife wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the chess player, when I painted it, the title was Chess Player. <laughs> but when my wife looked at it, when Tina looked at it, she said, oh, Nightfall. <laughs> because that, <laughs> that night that's, un that, you know, if you look at it from a particular point of view, the, the night is falling off the table. So, um yeah, it, yeah, down in the lower part of the canvas, there's a knight that's sort of hidden down there by the hand. And uh, Tina said, oh, nightfall. So I thought, well, yeah, that's a, that's a much better title. So so that's what I call it. So you can thank my wife. She is a collaborative <laughs> effort. But, but there must be, I mean, the, the, the title is one thing, but um, the, the, the fixation on cards and chess and these things, you said that comes up a lot. What's, yeah. what's the what's the origin of that fixation? The visual image. I love um, objects. And um, you know, like when I do one of my paintings where I just walk around the house and pick up objects, what I'm looking for is something that looks interesting and will look interesting in combination with something else. And um, playing cards um, are a, a great subject matter because they're so challenging. Um, and so interesting to, to combine in various ways. So some of my paintings are playing cards. And, and also I have this, um, this love of early modern painting. And if you think about some of Paul Cezanne's most famous paintings, it's a series of card player pain, paintings. And uh, uh, I've been doing that. I've been um, making my own card player pain, paintings as well. Uh, so yeah, playing cards uh, play a role chess um not only is chess a fun game i enjoy i haven't played it very much in recent years um but the chess pieces are so interesting uh and so various that um and and the chess board can be you can do so much with that visually so these are just um these are these are objects that uh, uh lend themselves to the kind of visual structures that uh, i'm looking for in, in canvas Thank you. 
Um, so Rochelle, then, um, can you can you walk us through your your technique with this kind of content first approach that you have? There must be um, a, a moment when here. Let's look at this one. So are you starting? I know that you said you started with this this self portrait, but um, do you start with the drawing? Do you just get her perfect, or are you filling in blocks of color as you go? Uh, I walk around with a few art journals, like most artists do, <laughs> disorganized around my house. Um, I had sketched her out a few times using my left hand. Remember that was new, so I've been. She was sort of my first subject, so I probably sketched her out. I don't know, twenty or thirty times. Um. I knew that there were certain components I wanted a, 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 around her. I wanted that ring around her. I knew early on. Um, the other thing, the blocking of colors kind of came to me once I had painted her onto the canvas. Okay. Um, when I put a sketch down on a canvas and then I do the gel coat over top, I tend to do a little bit of color blocking before I... Um, start painting the realistic part of her. Some of her um, outfit took shape the way it did because I had done a gel coat over the sketch and um, just the way the, the, um, the gel, it was a color gel coat, I should say. So um, just using that as a sort of inspiration or guide with those color blockings, it kind of all just finds itself together like some sort of puzzle. <laughs> yeah, because um, you, you did, you kind of um, joked that you just know that you're supposed to put cool tones in the back. Um, yeah. <laughs> which is, yeah. which is a, you know, a funny approach, just paint the whole painting and then go, oh, right, I remembered this rule, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, she's, I knew she was lacking depth. I don't, I mean, um, on the first one, she was, I knew that was a thing I needed to do. And I believe I did that sort of cityscape in the top initially before I painted her too. But with the other two, yeah, I was like, ooh, ooh these don't, they're, they're too, too dimensional. I needed to add a little bit more. Yeah. So um, funny development. Um, we do finally have Jan Vranchevich back. So if <laughs> I'm going to kick you guys off, introduce him. Okay. Um, so welcome, Jan. Thank you so welcome. much for joining I, us. I am not very versatile with technology. I think, and yeah, I it was probably get, the wrong. I didn't get the connection, how to get it. But here you are now. It's wonderful. Yes, I am here now. <laughs> and for everybody uh, watching from home, a man who likely needs little introduction, Jan Brancevic is an artist, poet, educator, and set designer who immigrated to Canada from Krakow, Poland in 1965. He worked for Brandon University for three decades and as a member of the Manitoba Arts Council for two decades. His art is known in public and private collections all over the world, including the National Gallery of Art in Krakow. Welcome, Jan. Why don't we go ahead? I'm gonna load up your, um, your paintings in the members show onto my screen. So here it is. Uh, nope, it's a little delay. There, there they are. <laughs> there they are. So this is um, this is a slightly different process. Why don't we just go through one at a time, and you'll tell me what they mean. Uh, should I comment on every one of them, or make general comment? Or <laughs> so you can't really see them here. So why don't we just go one one at a time, and I'll move along. Yes, okay. Okay. Okay, in my artistic career, I concentrated on many aspects of human life and life as an artist. One of them is the family and family relationships. I was always fascinated with uh, family life. I came from a large family of four gentlemen. <laughs> and. Uh, I grew up in a communist country. I remember the Second World War, the struggle of people during the war and after the war. 
find I end up in Canada in heavenly country <laughs> where I did have time and uh, to look from a perspective of time on the past. And in this particular work, I have a family here, mother with three children, the trees without foliage, probably indicating the poverty of that family. The color is very subdued. Uh, so that's basically what this painting is all about. Can we switch to the next one? And, uh, because I want to make some other comments after that. <laughs> Here we have in a uh, scene in a forest. Again, I don't draw individual trees. I just want to get the impression of the density of lush forest. And I think I captured this uh, relatively well. The coral play important part. Most of the time when people paint forests, they use greens and browns. I use reds and yellows and oranges because this somehow work with the composition. It brings the life to the composition. Okay, and the last one, again, human relationships. We have two individuals here, one on a red background, one on a blue background. I somehow perceive the one on a red, uh, on a blue background as a medical doctor, he's wearing the gown as a medical doctor. There is some uh, indication of the face when the patient on the left hand side have no face at all. Yet with the use of color, you can get the perception that this person is struggling, is struggling with help, is seeking help. And the doctor somehow have the attitude I cannot do anything for you. So that, that the conflict is right there. I like conflicts in my life. I went through many conflicts during my life and uh, I like to investigate this as far as possible, but not, I, in, uh, these are just three sa small samples of the work that I do. I brought actually one more work here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, the whole thing, where that conflict continuously uh, exists. You know, we have people here in uh, dull colors struggling. I don't know if they are dead or alive, no, but, and, uh, and I also do very abstracted work where I concentrate only on using pure elements. Uh, see, and colors, transparency. Some are very simple works and some, I also travel a lot. I observe the things. Some people take photographs of the cities and so on. I was in Halifax many years ago. I walk on the street in the rain and I did work with this computer generated work of the street in Halifax. And I have a number of things like that, you know, because what is what it means to me being an artist. Some people attend one uh, studio class and call themselves artists after doing one painting. For me, art is a little bit more than that. Artists, besides having technical knowledge of composition and materials and so on, artist is a philosopher who observes the world, analyzes that world and draw his own personal conclusions. And this is very, very, very important because artist is a creator, not recreated, not copist of the landscape or portraits or whatever, but gives more that philosophical aspect of who are you 
how you think, what you do. So it's a very complex issue. Artist as a philosopher. <laughs> if you have any questions, just ask me. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's very interesting. You know what? Why don't we bring everybody up, all of the artists, um, and we can we can talk among ourselves. So, um, what we were what we were getting started on is this kind of pendulum swing between Kurt's um, rigorous preparation work and Rochelle's um, kind of intuitive concept first work. And I think that you're kind of right in the middle between those where you have all of this very, very technical <laughs> skill and then you now you're using it to create this very emotional content. Uh, what should I say? I know, that, I know the gentleman we met some years ago at Wei Ming's for dinner. <laughs> And I know his background, he's professor of religion at university. And I look at your paintings. I admire your techniques of paintings. Thank they, you. They are very perfect techniques. You have control of the brushwork, control of the composition. I was not very happy with your uh, cubistic approach <laughs> to checkers. I, I, I know you can you can do your own approach to playing chess. <laughs> but basically I, I, I believe you do great work you know <laughs> you have great knowledge of art. <laughs> so and I met you I think at the opening we did have chat and uh, you told me what your problems are. I understand them very well. And you have excellent opportunity as a young budding artist to investigate this further. Because that's an unlimited topic in your life. And have guts, be strong, and have guts to explain, to portray your feelings, your own personal feelings. Be yourself. Don't try to copy anybody else. Okay? That's my <laughs> advice to you. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny, um, when you were talking, I, I think you were looking for pointillism with your, with Rochelle, with your... Um, yes. 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 With that piece. Um, I think that uh, what it really made me think of is Chuck Close's later work, where as... Um, as, as he became less capable of the fine control, he made things more complicated for himself with small abstract um, yeah. circular paintings to create that thing so that... Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Jack, Jack Close passed away. Yeah, yeah, just this year, huh? Unfortunately, he was a great artist who yeah. really had different approach to portraiture. Yeah, yeah, totally really started something. And you have to have those guts you now say, don't be like everybody else. You can learn how to paint like Leonardo or Rembrandt or whoever, you know, paint what you think is right. Yes. You yes. are the creator. You will always be influenced by other artists and by other people, but be yourself. That's the important thing. And I'm 80 years old and I still, I'm searching for myself. <laughs> yeah. And I try a variety of things. I, I did the first exhibition in 1959 when I was 18 years old. Uh, from that exhibition, I have, I think, uh, two or three works still in my collection that has disappeared in Poland. I love those works because I was honest as a child. I was still considering myself a child. And I try to remain a child when I'm 80, because child has the purity of mind, and that's so essential in art. And many people ignore that. They say, oh, I want to paint like Rembrandt. Go ahead, have fun. What's the point? 
Rembrandt was there in the 17th century. We can admire his work. We can learn techniques from him. But we cannot be Rembrandt in 20th century. We have to discover it ourselves. There's a new biography of da Vinci that opens. Um, Leonardo da Vinci had the great good fortune of being born out of wedlock. Yeah. This idea yeah. because he was situated outside, he didn't have to become a notary. He didn't have to go to these medieval schools. He was able to discover everything for himself. And without that, yeah. he never would have seen everything the way that he did. Yeah. And uh, some people think that you are born with a talent. I somehow question this. Yeah. Some people discover that they, they have a gift, they have interest in visual arts, and they approach this properly, and they have good master who whips them up from time to time, and they work very hard and very fast, they accomplish a great deal. Leonardo da Vinci spent four years studying in master studios. Yeah. It usually, during Renaissance, it usually took 12 years to graduate from master studio. He graduated after four years. He was a genius. No, he was hard working man who studied techniques, who know how to use brushes, who knew how to mix pigments and so on, work hard at it in order to accomplish something. And everybody can do it. I, I don't I don't think <laughs> I don't think everybody can be Da Vinci. Um, and again, because there there is a way of a, a way of seeing, a way of a yes. way of working that was unique to him. I think the reason that he was only in the master's studio for four years is because the master was sick of being overshadowed <laughs> in the paintings that he was making, right? <laughs> Uh, I, I painted uh, a few years a few years ago. I, I painted exhibition of copies of masterpieces, yeah. and I painted two Leonardo da Vinci's. One was uh, painting the, uh, the ermine, the with ermine yeah. because it was in my hometown. So I see it as a young boy many many times. Every Sunday, my father took me to the museum to look at Leonardo da Vinci. So it was very close to me. The second one, I have seen only once. I was in Paris, in Louvre, and I see that painting. By the way, I don't like Mona Lisa. <laughs> I spent five minutes looking at Mona Lisa in Louvre and never again. But I see, <laughs> but I see in Louvre La Peronniere, beautiful portrait of a lady. And my grandson, when I was working on those copies of uh, masters, came and said, Grandpa, when are you going to paint painting for me? I said, okay, sit down in front of the computer and find yourself a painting and I will make a copy for you. True enough, he found himself Leonardo La Ferroniere. <laughs> it took me two years to paint that bloody thing. <laughs> <laughs> the techniques that uh, Leonardo used, glazing and so on, it takes hours and hours and hours to do it. My daughter came and said, Dad, what are you going to paint for me? I said, which one would you like? Vermeer. Lady with pearl earring, girl with pearl earring. <laughs> That bloody thing took me long. I was fortunate actually when I was painted. It took me only about six months to do it. But I just about have the painting finished and I have to paint her lips. And I try, I have a variety of red colors and mixing and so on. Couldn't get the right color. Fortunately, there was an art historian from New York who did computerized study of that painting at the same time, and she published blog every day. So I follow her every day, discovering whether I was doing right things or not. The first thing that I discovered, and I discovered this on my own, uh, that he probably painted the painting black and white first. 
And true enough, computer study indicated, yes, there was a black and white painting on the knees of that color. But through the days, I think the whole study lasted about three weeks. On the last day, she announced that he used vermilion red for the lips. So I searched my boxes with prints, couldn't find vermilion red, went on the internet to buy tube of vermilion red. Tube of vermilion red, I might, like my tomb, was $100. I say I'm not going to spend $100 on, on the lips because I will never use that color again. So back to the studio, searching old boxes and so on, and I found four brand new tubes of vermilion. <laughs> Use it for the lips, work perfectly. And then Wei Ming, who you know, <laughs> great artist, came to visit me and said, use lots of reds in your landscape. Yeah, yeah, I use. Did you ever use vermilion? I say no, it's too expensive. So I give him <laughs> a new tube of vermilion red. I say, you can have it. The other three tubes I put somewhere in a safe place. <laughs> and a few years ago, I still cannot find them. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, artists are messy. We have hiding spots that we don't remember. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but if you ever need a million, I invite you to my studio to bring <laughs> a dog. And if you find it, it's yours. <laughs> you, you're like a dealer now for, for Brandon. <laughs> But Kurt, you said that uh, that you were experiment experimenting with sand because of Brock? Mm -hmm. And others, but yeah, I learned it from Brock. Yeah, uh, and how was that experience for you? Um, it's been working out well. Um, hang on a second here. Sure. That canvas right there, can you see it? Yeah. Uh, the the uh, grandfather clock thing? Yeah, yeah that is a uh, painting on sand. Uh, I had that in the member show a couple years ago, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, it's 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 an interesting challenge, and you don't want to use your good brushes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, um, if you um, if you experiment a little bit first, um, you can produce some worthwhile images uh, with that with that kind of combination. It's really an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. It does. It, it's it kind of flattens visually, but um, three-dimensionalizes literally, right? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it creates, it, you know, for an abstract painting, uh, you want to emphasize that this is pigment smeared on a flat surface, yeah. and the, the sand accentuates that reality so that, um, you know, when you're looking at uh, a combination of, of um, fake three-dimensional images, uh, what you see is um, mm -hmm. uh, paint smeared on a uh, surface, and, and that uh, sand will accentuate that uh, that effect. Yeah, yeah. It, this reminds me of um, if, if we can go back to the to the fifteenth, sixteenth century again of those um, audition portraits, audition self portraits that that masters would do, where they would paint their own palette. And they wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to just put paint on their palette. They had to paint it really carefully, you know, with all these different oh. colors, even though it's a representation of itself. Yeah. Interesting. I, I, used to have a, I used to have a friend, she was a German artist living in Brenner. Her husband was professor of German and French at university. And uh, she experimented with variety of materials. He smoked pipe at that time. And every time he put the pipe away, she cleaned it up and collected all the tobacco and mixed that with paints, producing wonderful effects. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. No reason that that fine material, right? Yeah. As an artist, you have to have the guts and use unusual things. As a, as a young boy, in that for my first exhibition, I was interested in printmaking. Of course, the printmaking is an expensive process. Most of the techniques, you need tools, you need equipment and so on. But I wanted to do printmaking. 
I went somewhere for a summer, summer camp or whatever, and I collected some birch bark. Because I like that, no? so I did have 10 layers of birch bark. And then I said, why don't I try something? I drew a pencil on a birch bark, and birch bark is very thin, like paper. So when you press the pencil on the back, you get the embossed mm. drawing. And I ink that and make the prints from that. Of course, you can make only one or two prints from each thing. After that, you destroy the plate. Yeah. But I did that. Interesting. That's really interesting. So you have to experiment and uh, have fun. Yeah. Yeah, I can really see, Rochelle, I can see your work going into kind of a print collage, kind of mixed media yeah. direction because of that mixing of of, um, of opacities that you already do, the abstracts and the drips and the, yeah. And I say, don't, don't, yeah. don't be, don't be afraid to experiment. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You no, know? but maybe next time you try it again, and it will work. You know? Yeah, I've yeah. yeah. got. <laughs> yes, I, I could fill a museum with all my tragedies, all my failures. <laughs> <laughs> we all could. <laughs> every kind of artist, when you hate something. Every artist does have failures. Believe me. I do, lately I'm not doing that many words, you know, maybe three or four a month. But if I look at it when it's completed for a week or two weeks and I don't like it, I rip it up and throw it away. It, yep. My garbage is full. Yep. <laughs> not There's no room for storing things anyway. If you, if you experiment, there are some successes and some failures. And accept that. Yeah. So that's human to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody ever has to know except for you. Oh, uh, uh, once, <laughs> once, once, once you come to a certain stage in your career, career, then there is no problem with admitting I am wrong or say no, that's right, and you who do you argue with? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and another thing is experiment with tools that you use. Yes. Some people think I, I have only one brush and I will do everything with that one brush. No, that's impossible. That's why we have variety of brushes, different shapes, different sizes, different bristles or, or hair from squirrels or whatever mm -hmm. animals. Yeah. Uh, you use experiment with them because you get variety of techniques, variety of effects using different brushes. Experiment with thickness of the paint. But if you don't know, ask. I did a former student of mine who is a very good portrait painter right now, came to me and he said, I do some portraits for commissions. But oil paints take a long time to dry. I say, did you ever use secative? What is secative? That's a traditional European name. Japanese dryer. The problem is that Japanese dryer was using commercial oil paints here to paint the walls because they dry much faster. And I discovered there was one store in Brandon about two years ago that they have Japanese dryer and they were, they put it on sale. Bottle about half a liter bottle was for $2. Usually it used to be $20. So I bought a few bottles and I told him, say, go and buy that Japan dryer and you add a little bit to the paint. So about a week later, he phones me and say, you give me wrong advice. <laughs> I added to the paint. The paint was dry, but was peeling up after one week. <laughs> I say, I told you, you add a little bit, just few drops. <laughs> he added probably have a bottle of that. Right, using it like a regular medium. 
So you have to you have to you have to experiment and have proportions of mediums and so on. Some people use turpentine with oil paint on them. I always mix my own painting medium. And I have painting medium that I use for probably 50 years and it works for me. One third of turpentine, one third of oil, one third of, third of varnish. Beautiful painting medium. So simple. Why don't I use commercial painting mediums? Because yet I don't know what junk they put in it's and true. how the paint will affect. If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself, eh? Yeah, you have to study. There are there are there are manuals uh, dealing with uh, the technology of painting and so on, and how to use them. And if you read them, uh, some people say reading about the techniques of art is boring. I find this fascinating. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's a it's a wonderful. We have to end here because we've gone over our hour mark. Um, but it's a wonderful point to end on this idea of um, of uh, bridging the the creative, the instinctual, and the scientific um, yeah. methodical approaches to art, and this idea of finding solutions in between the two of them. Hmm? Yeah. But that's where the solutions live. Okay. Well. <laughs> Thank you all so much, Kurt, Rochelle, Jan. It's been yeah. a real pleasure having you. Um, this video will be up on YouTube in uh, just a little while if you wanted to spread it around your um, your network. Um, same with everybody who's watching live. This is being recorded. So feel free to. And thank you very much for joining us. The member show and sale is on until December 18th at the AGSM. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Take care. <laughs>